Today, Sylvie and I are in the Bedfordshire village of Clophill, which is situated about five miles to the south of the county town of Bedford. In the 19th century, Clophill was renowned for straw plaiting, where the women in the village would gather up all the straw at harvest time and plait it for the hat making industry. And although Clophill did have its own hat factory, many women took their plaited straw to the Flying Horse pub, where a buyer for the hat industry would pay the women and take the plaited straw to Luton, which was the main centre for hat making. But before we set off on our walk, Sylvie and I are taking a walk up to the hilltop outside of the village to view one of Clophill's main attractions. We leave the high street near the eastern edge of the village and take a trackway which goes for about half a mile up the hill. Eventually, we reached the ruins of St Mary's Old Church. This church fell into disuse after a new one was built in the village in 1845. Back in the 1960s and 70s, the church became the focus of a lot of media attention when it was discovered that black mass rituals and even devil worship had been taking place here. And there are also many stories of paranormal activity taking place around the old church. Its reputation draws many visitors, even to this day. Well, after we've looked round the old ruins, Sylvie and I stopped to read the many verses from poems that have been carved into flagstones laid out in the churchyard.
Well, with that bit of sightseeing done, we head back down through the village and towards our next destination, the neighbouring village of Malden. We set off along the Clophill Road in a westerly direction. Just a few hundred yards down the lane, we turn onto a footpath which takes us out of the village and up to a wooded hillside. About three quarters of a mile along the path we come to a place called Green End Farm which is a very pretty old building which looks as if it's just been rethatched. Continuing along the footpath, we come to the outskirts of the neighbouring village of Malden. We follow the path up through the churchyard and then down into the village. This village, just like many others, is suffering from the curse of excessive modern development. But at least it still has its old characterful timber frame pub, the White Hart. With Covid lockdown now being relaxed, at least Sylvie and I can now enjoy a refreshing pint in the beer garden.
Well, suitably refreshed, we now set off for the next destination, the village of Amptill. Amptill has its place in history for several reasons. It was the birthplace of a man by the name of Richard Nichols. Nichols was commissioned in 1664 to oversee the territories that had been won after we defeated the Dutch in North America. And in doing so, he became the first governor of New York. He returned to England in 1668, but just as war broke out with the Dutch yet again. It was during a sea battle off the coast of Suffolk when Nichols was tragically killed after being hit by a cannonball. Sylvie and I are going into the local church here to see the memorial to Richard Nichols, which, amazingly, has the actual cannonball mounted in the top of it. Also in the church is a stained glass window commemorating King Henry VIII's first wife, Catherine of Aragon, who lived here during her divorce from the king. After visiting the church, Sylvia and I start heading down into the village centre, which has become increasingly busy over recent years. We're now walking out of the village centre and heading up to Cooper's Hill, an area of heathland above the village, which is also a nature reserve.
path eventually brings us out onto the Woburn Road and it's here we cross over and enter Amp Hill Park. We pass by the cafe and the visitors centre in the park and walk up the hill. And it's here we come to a monument to over 700 men of the Bedfordshire Regiment who died during World War I. And the site was also home to a large army training camp during the First War. A short distance away is another monument, and this one is known as Catherine's Cross. The cross is situated on the site of Ampthill Castle, which was built in the 1400s. And it was here that Catherine of Aragon lived during the period of a divorce from Henry VIII. Looking at the hilltop now, it's hard to imagine that a castle ever existed here. But the evidence is just beneath the grass. Is that an old tile? Yeah, looks medieval. <laughs> like me. Catherine of Aragon, probably sheltered underneath that roof tile. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> See the old rabbits have been chirping them out, haven't they? Yeah. <laughs> Why can't they chirp the coins out as well? <laughs> Never mind. We're now heading back into the village, where we take another road out to visit one of Amptill's other historic attractions.
About three quarters of a mile to the north of the village, we come to the ruins of Houghton House. Houghton House is a Jacobean mansion which was built in 1615 for Mary Herbert, the Countess of Pembroke. And the house is also believed to be the inspiration for Palace Beautiful in John Bunyan's book The Pilgrim's Progress. Houghton House later became the property of the fourth Duke of Bedford. His son, the Marquess of Tavistock, lived there until he died in 1767. And it was the 5th Duke of Bedfordshire who ordered the house to be dismantled in the year 1794. Well, after our visit to Houghton House, Sylvie and I set off on the long walk back to Clop Hill. Well, when we eventually arrived back in Clop Hill, Sylvia and I decided to seek out a pub on one of Clop Hill's back streets for a quick drink before we head home. And the walk has lasted nearly seven hours and covered over 15 miles. So we feel like we've earned a drink. Well, suitably refreshed, we head off for home and we look forward to our next walk.